Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray that you'll use it in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, help us, God, to be surrendered to it. And uh, we pray that you'll help me as I preach this morning to do so in accuracy to the text and the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If, uh, if you are not a Christian in public, you may not be a Christian at all. Um, you, if you do not claim Christ publicly, then maybe you have no claim to make at all. Um, in, un in other words, an undercover Christian is a fake Christian. You know that? I'm going to silence my phone real quick because if I don't, it will go off. <laughs> Sorry. If nobody knows you're Christian, then maybe you're not. You ever think about that? As Christians, it's absolutely imperative that we claim Christ and make that claim publicly. The Christian life is not a private religion. Some people like to say, well, you can be a Christian and that's fine. Just keep it to yourself. It's not designed that way. The Christian life is not designed for you to, to sit soak and sour, so to speak, and, and hold it all in and just take in the truth uh, and, and not give it out. The Christian life is designed to make a difference in its environment. And it does this principally by claiming Christ and doing that publicly. Now, how do we publicly claim Christ? I mean, uh, what are some ways, some practical ways that you and I uh, can publicly claim to be a Christian? Well, one way is pretty obvious, and that is this, witnessing. You, if, if you tell somebody about Jesus... That's a pretty public claim of Christ. Um, and uh, so that's, that's uh, one, of the, one of the main ways, one of the most confrontational ways, and every Christian ought to witness. Uh, another way to publicly claim Christ is to faithfully attend a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing Christian church. Uh, you, ought to, you ought to be uh, in church, and, and what by, when I say in church, I don't mean in the building, but fellowshipping in the body of Christ. That's what it means to be in church. We are the church. Another way to publicly claim Christ is to love other Christians. Uh, Christians ought to love Christians. Another way to publicly claim Christ is to live holy lives separated from the world. You know, it's the old salt and light principle. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. What does that mean? Well, if we're light, that implies that the world is darkness. And if we're salt, a preserving agent, that implies that the world is rotting. And Jesus said, you are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So we refuse to endorse sin. And that brings the scorn of sinners who love their sin. So there are probably many other items we could add to the list that would help us to claim Christ publicly, but keeping track of a list is always pretty tedious. And checking off items and things like that can be rather difficult, but we really don't need a list because we can boil all of it down to one great key factor, one main idea. What is the key factor? What must you do to claim Christ publicly, constantly in your life? Well, it's this. To claim Christ publicly, you have to give Him your life. You have to, you have to take your life and hand it to Him to, to claim Christ publicly. That is the only way it really works. Look with me, if you will, at Matthew chapter 10. That's where we're at this morning as we're moving through the book of Matthew. And we come to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. And to claim Christ publicly, which we all must do, we must give Him our lives. Matthew chapter 10 verse 32, Jesus says this to His disciples, "...whosoever therefore shall confess Me before men..." 
Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Look with me over here at verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. I want you to notice that in this passage of Scripture, Jesus expected his disciples to publicly profess him as their Lord. He expected them to publicly tell others about him. In fact, that's what he's sending them out to do. He uh, also said that whoever lost their lives for his sake would find it. He did not say whoever lost their life would find it. But he said whoever loses their life for my sake, for his sake, will find it. Sort of like lost and found. You lose it and you find it. Jesus called and sent his 12 apostles out on a special mission. That's what Matthew chapter 10 is about. Their, their mission was to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to, to the cities of Israel. And Jesus, in sending them, prepared them by telling them there's going to be some stiff opposition. There's going to be persecution. There's, there's going to be problems along the way as you preach. He told them how to defeat the fear that they would experience as they proclaimed the gospel. He told them if they would just fear God, they wouldn't have to worry about fearing men and what they could do to them. And so Jesus showed them that God deeply cared about them. He, he even pointed out that, that God knows the number of hairs on your head. As Jesus encouraged his disciples to proclaim the gospel, even in spite of opposition, he gave them a wonderful promise. Jesus said, someday I'm going to claim you when I stand before my Father. On the judgment day, I'm going to say to my Father, that one's mine. That one's with me. Wouldn't you, uh, wouldn't you like when you stand before God in judgment to have the Son of God, Jesus Christ, say, that one's mine. I make a claim for him. I make a claim for her. Well, Jesus gave them a promise that if they would publicly claim him on earth, he would claim them. In another passage of Scripture, Jesus said he would claim them before his Father and before the holy angels, all the assembled hosts of heaven. And Jesus will point at you and say, mine. What a great promise that we can claim. This promise is not a promise that Jesus just gave to his 12 disciples because if we look back in verse 32, he says, whosoever therefore will will uh, confess me. Not just, hey, you twelve. Whosoever. He's opening this up to everybody. It's for us. So this morning, we're going to look at this promise and see it as an imperative or as a command. Jesus is assuming that we understand that this is something we're supposed to do. And Jesus here is telling His disciples and He's telling us that uh, we must publicly proclaim Him. He gives both sides of the coin. Confess me before men and I'll confess you. Deny me before men, and I will deny you before my Father. And so, uh, his disciples and us were to publicly proclaim him. Jesus basically tells us here that our profession of him isn't just a private matter, but it's public. And we're, we're going to see that confessing Christ publicly is not easy. We know that from experience, though, don't we? And the Bible says so too. It's difficult. It's hard at times. It's not always a, a bed of roses to, to tell others that you're a Christian, to identify yourself with Christ. Many people refuse to do it because the cost is just too high for their tastes. Christ addresses these difficulties. Jesus doesn't leave us in the dark. He doesn't say, all right, go out and serve me. Go out and claim to be a Christian. Then do this because I said so. He doesn't do that. Uh, he gives us all the help we need. Jesus tells us how to overcome the difficulties, the fear, the, the problems, the issues, the cost. And so he begins to point that the greatest excuses will not stop us from publicly proclaiming Christ if we have this one key. And there are some good excuses. And I think everybody under the power of my voice, myself included, 
has bought into some of these excuses. And so we're going to see this is the key, that if you hold this key, the excuses won't stop you, and you will publicly proclaim Christ. What is the key? The key is this, to claim Christ publicly, you have to give him your life. You must hand it over to him, lock, stock, and barrel. Now what does this mean? I mean, how do you give your life to Christ? What is, what is, what is involved in it? What do you have to do to give your life to Christ? Well, first of all, you have to give Christ your identity. If you're going to give your life to Christ, you have to, you have to give him who you are, your public persona, your private persona, every bit of who you are. Your, your identification becomes not just you, but Christ. Here in verse 32, the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. The word confess here, it means to publicly, to de publicly declare something, to profess something in public. It also means to agree with someone, to say the same thing about something that somebody else has said. For instance, when we confess our sins... As 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Uh, if we confess our sins, we are professing our agreement with God about our sins, that they're evil and that we must forsake them and repent. Um, as I looked at this word confess, Vincent's word studies uh, did a, has a really good insight on it. He says it implies identification of the confessor with the confessed. And basically, it takes confession out of the category of just a mere verbal acknowledgement and moves it into the sphere of not just saying, yeah, that's true, but saying, yeah, that's me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, instead of saying, hey, I believe, you know, I believe in Jesus, and uh, yeah, I, I believe maybe there's that body of truth. Instead of just saying that, you're saying, yeah, that's true, and I accept it, and I submit to it, and that is me. I identify with it. Shortly after marrying me, my wife Lisa had to file some paperwork with the government. You ladies, most of you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, she had to file paperwork with the Social Security office to have her last name legally changed from Wells to Buman. Now, uh, they probably wondered why she would... Uh, change from such a normal name to such a dumb name, but uh, anyway, she had to do it. And uh, by inviting her uh, friends and family to witness our exchange of vows by taking my last name, by wearing my ring, by living with me, my wife has given me her identity. She's, now on Facebook, you can look her up, she's Lisa Wells Buman, so she kind of, you know, she retains some of her identity, but it's different isn't it? When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become part of the church, which is His bride. You take on His name. You're no longer just you. You're a Christian. He, his Spirit lives within you. You give Jesus your identity. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He said, just like, just like a man and a woman uh, change their identity to identify with one another, so Christ and the church are, 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 claim, are, are identified together. I want you to know what Jesus is not saying here. In verse 31 and verse 32 and 33, he says, Whosoever, he basically says, If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. So there's a promise. It's got a positive and a negative side. And basically, I want you to understand what Jesus is not saying here. He's not saying that you have to earn salvation by making a brave, bold, public move. He's, he's not saying that at all. Uh, in fact, 
uh, if we compare Scripture with Scripture, we understand that you can't earn your salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Salvation is not of you. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and so when you get to heaven, you can't stand up and say, uh, uh, Jesus, I earned my way here because I stood up and I said I'm a Christian in front of people that didn't like it. It's not... Jesus is not saying you earn salvation by claiming Him. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, if we compare this Scripture with Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, uh, we know this Scripture, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Then He gives the order. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's first. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so, uh, what the Bible teaches, and in harmony with what Jesus teaches here, is, is, that, um, is that this is something where you've already been saved. A person that's already been saved, Jesus says, he's talking to his disciples, they're believers, he says, you are believers, and so you are going to confess me before men. And a person that trusts Christ, trusts Christ first in their heart before it ever comes out their lips. And so a true Christian is a person that publicly professes Christ because privately they've already received Him. And He's already done that work. I also understand that this uh, passage... Um, I understand this passage to teach that those who are truly saved will publicly identify with Christ. True Christians... Claim Him publicly. There are no secret, undercover Christians. And the opposite is true. If you are not a Christian, you will not publicly claim Christ. You will be ashamed of Him. You will, you will, uh, you will balk at that. At every opportunity, you will balk. And He will deny you after you've done a lifetime of denying Him. He will deny you before His Father. And you know, claiming Christ is not just a one-time deal. Uh, claiming Christ is a lifestyle. It is a lifetime deal. You know, Judas Iscariot claimed Christ one time at least. He followed him along for a while, but then he denied Christ because he never was a real believer. But then you have the Apostle Peter. Peter denied Christ three times, right? And he even swore an oath and said, I don't even know him. And he took an oath and a curse on himself. In, in that day. Yet, Judas Iscariot was the false professor, and Peter, though he slipped up, Peter, through a lifetime, confessed Christ. You say, well, pastor, there's been times in my life where I've had the opportunity to stand up and say something, and I didn't take that opportunity. Welcome to the club. Me too. But a true Christian will not for their entire life, by their words and by their actions and by their silence and by their attitudes, will not deny Christ. It's a lifetime in view here. And so, it's a life pattern. What does it mean to publicly identify with Christ or to claim Him? What does that mean? I mean, how do we confess Christ before men? Well, we claim Christ with our lips when we tell others that we're Christian or that they need to be one. But that's not all. We claim Christ with our lives. If you claim Christ with your lips, yet deny Him with your lifestyle, then you're not really claiming Christ at all. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, um, Jesus talked about the judgment, and He says, Not everyone that saith to Me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of My Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, excuse me, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and have we not in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart me, ye that work, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So Jesus says there's there's some that are going to stand in judgment and say, God, I, I did make a claim for you. And Jesus says, Your lips made a claim and your life said something different. And it didn't match up. It was no real claim at all. 
When we identify publicly with Christ, we identify with who He is, God alone, the way, the truth, the life, exclusively. That's not popular to believe that. We identify with His Word and live by its principles and its precepts. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So to claim Christ publicly, you must give Him your life. That's the first part of what it means to, to uh, claim Him. You have to identify with Him. You have to give Him your identity to publicly claim Christ. Uh, you, you have to, uh, to become Him, like Him. What else does it mean to give your life to Jesus? There's some, some more to it. What else is there? Well, not only give Christ your identity, but give Christ your love. You've heard the statement, real, love, real men love Jesus. Uh, you, you see some of that stuff. What does it mean to give Christ your love? Uh, what, what, what is all involved in that? Well, look at verse 34. Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter at variance against her mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Give Christ. As you give him your life, you have to give him your identity. You have to give him your love. Back here in, uh, Jesus says in verse 34, uh, Jesus, by the way, Jesus gives peace. He gives the peace that passes all understanding to all who come to Him. But Jesus told His disciples something disturbing here. He says, think not that I have come to, send, to bring peace. In other words, don't be under the illusion, He says. Don't suppose that my message is going to bring peace to your life and to your world as you proclaim it and others receive it. He says, don't be fooled, that's not going to happen. The gospel brings peace with God, but it brings war with the world. It brings conflict with the unbelievers. See, the disciples were under the impression that Jesus was going to rule and reign in Jerusalem soon. In their lifetime, he, he was the Messiah, they thought, that would, that would set Israel free from Roman bondage, and they would be like his 12 vice presidents. They're always arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. What do you think they were talking about? They were talking about when Jesus got to Jerusalem, who's going to get the better cabinet positions in his new government? That's, that was their mindset. And so as Jesus sends them out, he says, he says you guys are, are, are under some kind of delusion here. Let me dispel the, just the illusion that you're under right here, right now. He doesn't describe the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is peace. He doesn't describe the message of the gospel here, but he, he describes the results of when the gospel is preached. The results of when it's received in one, by one person in a household and rejected by others. And that result is not peace. It's conflict. He says in verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father. What does that word set at variance mean? What's well, the Greek word dikadzo? Properly it means to cut into two parts. To cut something uh, into two different parts and place a, a gap between them and divide. And basically, it means to drive a wedge between two parties. And so he says, Here I am, I am driving a wedge between who, who are the two parties? Between father and mother. Who does he divide? Friends. Yeah, he divides friends, sure. But even more than that, families, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters. Jesus says, the person who identifies with me publicly after receiving my gospel may find that his enemies are in his own house. That's what he says in verse 34. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Every Christian has at least one enemy. It's called your adversary, the devil. Um, 
Jesus says that, the, that his gospel divides even families when one member receives him. What's so important about this? Why is Jesus pointing this out to his disciples? Well, Jesus told his disciples that, the, that they have to publicly claim him. He told them that those who receive the gospel, they, when they preach the gospel, he says, some, some people are going to receive this. And he told them that, that it's, he, as he told them that, it became necessary to deal with the consequences. To deal with what was going to tempt those people who received the gospel to not publicly claim him, to deny him. What was going to tempt the apostles as they preached to shut up, to be quiet and stop claiming Christ publicly. Many people, he says, in verse 33, we go back to this, he says, whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, I will deny before my Father. Many people would deny Christ. Why? Why would you want to deny Christ? I mean, look at the promise. Well, the temptations to deny Christ publicly are the greatest temptations of all. And Jesus deals with the strongest of them, the strongest temptations here. For instance, we love peace. Do we not love peace? We, we want to have a peaceful life, free of conflict. I don't want to get up in the morning and have to deal with drama. Do you? But if you, if you have accepted Christ and claim Him publicly, from time to time that can bring some drama, some, some real problems. We love our peace. And what's nearer and more dear to us and more sacred than family? In verse 35 and verse 36 he says, a man's enemies, a man's foes are in his own house. Um, What's, what's dearer to us than family? Yet, those who claim Christ publicly and their families are not believers, they risk the loss of those families. Or at the, at the least, they risk living with unsaved family members and that can bring conflict. And it can bring a daily conflict. These two temptations to, not, to deny Christ are powerful, but the greatest temptation to deny Christ is life itself. He says in verse 38, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life shall find it. We love our lives. But he who publicly claims Christ must be willing to give up that life for Christ. You know you can lose your life in several ways. He's like, well, yeah, Pastor, there's you know, 10,000 ways to die, right? No, you can lose your life even without dying. You can lose your life, of course, by martyrdom, by, by being killed for Christ. But you can also um, lose, by claiming Christ, lose advantages. You can lose comforts. You can lose friends. You can lose money. You can, you can lose so many things by claiming Christ. By becoming a slave to Christ. You lose the idea of living on your own rules and your own terms because you have to live on His. In verse 37, um, in verse 38, Jesus says, To publicly identify with me, you must be willing to lose those whom you love most, your family. He says, in Luke chapter 14, a parallel passage, Jesus says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What does that passage mean? Are you supposed to hate your family if you come to Christ? No. Well, I've heard it explained this way. When you, when you love Jesus, you should love Him so much that even your love for your family seems like hatred. You ever heard it explained that way? Maybe not, all right? Well, good, because that's not the way it's supposed to be explained. Uh, what it means is, I mean, that's kind of silly. How could love seem like hatred, even in by comparison? What this means is that if you, Jesus says, if any man comes to me and he's not willing to part with, all of these people, if he's not willing to be divided from 
uh, his father, mother, wife, and children and in, in, a, in the same manner as if he hated them. If he's not willing to make that sacrifice, he cannot be my disciple. We come back to this passage in verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me. Look at that term. More than me is not worthy. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so, we have to give Him our love to give Him our life. In verse 38, He makes an interesting statement. He that taketh not His cross and followeth after Me is not worthy of Me. Um, you know the cross was not a religious symbol to them. In fact, in Matthew 10.38 is the first time that Jesus mentioned the cross. Up until this point, the disciples had no clue about it. They'd never heard about it. When they saw a cross, they didn't think Christianity. When they saw a cross, they didn't, they didn't think Jesus and the Gospel. When they saw a cross, they saw an electric chair. They saw an instrument of shame, an instrument of death, an instrument of government condoned execution. They saw a table for lethal injection. They saw a noose. They saw... Uh, death instruments. They did not see some piece of, of jewelry. They didn't see something pretty. They saw only shame and only defamation and only death. Could you imagine if Jesus said to you this, this morning, take up your electric chair or sit down in your electric chair, strap in and follow me. That's what he was saying when he said, take up your cross and follow me. Some people say, well, everybody's got their cross to bear. and That's true. But being sick is not your cross to bear. Or, uh, or, or your car breaking down is not your cross to bear. Those are just parts of life. In fact, those are really the results of our, all, all of our fall into sin. Your cross to bear is the persecution that you endure for publicly identifying with Christ. For one, it might be someone giving you a hard time on the job. For another, it might be a neighbor who just won't stop uh, ribbing you or won't talk to you. Or for others, it could be a family member. And it's always conflict when you're around them, even at family reunions. See this word take, verse 38? It's voluntary. Nobody can lay it on you. You must take it up yourself. And then the word his, it's personalized. It's different for you than it is for me, but everybody has a cross. And so he's saying... You won't publicly claim me until you love me more than everything that you hold nearest and dearest to your heart. More than your peace, more than your family, more than your own life. Jesus says, love me most of all. Take away your family, take away your life. What do you have? Nothing. In the, word, in the song, America the Beautiful, it's written, O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. What is that song saying about patriots who gave their life for their country? It's saying that they loved something more than themselves and more than their own lives. They loved America that much. But we must love Jesus more than anything else. More than peace, more than family, and more than life. So what does it mean? That, that's what it means to give Jesus your love. So to claim Christ publicly, you have to give Him your life. You have to give Him your identity. That's part of giving your life. You have to give Him your greatest love. And there's one more thing. If you're going to give Christ your life and publicly identify with Him, you must Give Christ your hope. Give Him your expectation. Make your future investment with Him. Lay all your hopes on Jesus Christ. Look at verse 40. Jesus says, He that receiveth you receiveth Me. And he that receiveth Me receiveth him that sent Me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Here Jesus gives a blessed promise 
for all who would receive the gospel and for all who would preach the gospel. And the promise is needed because these people, as the disciples went out and preached the gospel of the kingdom, and they were enduring persecution, whoever received them into their house might face the same persecution. You know what I'm saying? If someone's being persecuted and you aid them and abet them, then that persecution might fall on you too. So it was a risk for people to invite the disciples in to feed them and to allow them to preach in and around their house. And so uh, the promise was needed so that these people would know when they received the disciples and received their message, they were receiving Christ and the Father. They were receiving eternal life. They were going to the kingdom of heaven. They were risking house, home, family, and life. In other words, they were risking all that they had invested on this earth and sinking their claims into Jesus Christ. And He gave them this promise. He says, you'll never lose that reward. Look at this in verse 41. We see he'll receive a prophet's reward. The end of verse 41, what's the last word in the verse? Reward. What is the last word in verse 42? Reward. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, I'm watching and I'm waiting to give you your reward. Now, I don't know what that reward is for everybody, but I do know this. There's a, it's a better return on your investment than anything you could ever do here on earth. It's better than the stock market. It's superior to a CD. It's better than, than uh, real estate investments. It's better than lottery tickets. <laughs> Way better. Um, you know why people pay? Uh, why do banks pay people to invest money? I mean, they give you a percentage on your savings account. They used to give you something good on CDs. That seems to have gone away. But hopefully, uh, what they want you to do is uh, when, when you've invested enough money, you can retire and be set for life, right? That's the plan, depending on where you invest it, 401k, bank accounts, this and that. Here, Jesus promises, and there's nothing, I'm not preaching against that, uh, but Jesus promises a reward that cannot be lost to all who risk everything who risked anything to publicly identify with Christ. The promise is this, even the smallest act. Here he says in verse 42, just a cup of water. He says, I, I noticed that. Even the smallest act identifies you publicly with the message of Christ, and it won't go unrewarded. God earlier, Jesus earlier said that the Father even notices when a sparrow falls to the ground. And he notices every act that identifies us with Christ. So how can you be willingly to publicly identify with Christ? How, do we need to come up with a list of things that we need to do? No. All you have to do is give Him your life. Now that's a lot. Give Him your identity. Give Him your love. Give Him your hope. In the minute they're going to come and bring an invitation to Him. But in ancient Rome, there was a governor named Pliny. And Pliny was the governor of a province called Bithynia in northern Asia Minor in the early days of the Christian church. And Pliny wrote a letter to Emperor Trajan. Emperor Trajan uh, received this letter from Pliny and, and it is preserved for us through the years of history. And in his letter to the emperor, Pliny tries to explain to the emperor why he is so unsuccessful in his attempts to stamp out this new religious sect, this sect called Christianity. And he's been trying to stop it, and he's been trying to stamp it out, and it just won't go away. And, and he's trying to explain why it's not working. And he, Pliny try, he, he tells Emperor Trajan that he's arrested them, he's fined them, he's thrown them in prison, he has had them beat and tortured, and even explored various forms of execution in order to get them to renounce Christ and to burn incense to worship the emperor, but to no avail. Trying to excuse himself for his failure to stop Christianity, Pliny wrote this. He said, none of these acts those who are really Christians can be compelled to do. He's, or, or by none of these acts, those who are really Christians can be compelled to do it, to burn incense to the emperor. So I've tried all of this, and some of them will deny Christ, but the real Christians won't. 
That was the point. And when you publicly identify with Christ, you will face opposition here or there. It may not be what they dealt with. I hope not. What will it take to shut you up? A little shame? A little embarrassment? A little discomfort? What will silence your claim for Christ? A risk of family? A risk of money? Job? Popularity? Friends? Love? Life? And that's why, because of that risk... See, the risk isn't just stuff that we think we can afford to lose. I mean, if it was just, you know, if it was something we... Uh, there are things we can deal without, you know. When it comes to family and friends and life and all of that, there's only one way we can publicly identify with Christ. And that is beforehand. Give Him your life. 